Revelation 12. We'll pick back up with verse 6 where we left off and we'll read verse 6. And then we'll continue through to about verse 12 tonight. Revelation 12, starting in verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had the place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto the dead. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the seal. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Let's pray. Lord, we do praise you again tonight to be able to be in your house. Lord, for everyone that's come out tonight, thankful for the worship we've already taken part in. Lord, now as we open your word, we're thankful that uh, uh, we can learn of it tonight. And, yeah. Lord, we can take it again and allow it to motivate us to be about your business. <laughs> Lord, we're just thankful that uh, even now we believe that the devil knows that uh, his time is short. And, yeah. uh, we praise you for your promises and we praise you for an eternal life and an eternal kingdom mm -hmm. and a new heaven and a new earth that's coming. Lord, we're thankful that because of what Christ did on the cross for us, we can have a part in that. So we praise you tonight just for who you are. And Lord, we come to you to lift you up. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I, I kind of got into verse 6. Didn't get a lot into verse 6. The more I uh, got away from Sunday night, the more I wanted to go back to verse 6 and start there and look at a couple of things. Uh, Brad and I left one off, so I do need to throw you one curveball. In in my tried to send Brad all of the notes that I would need for tonight, and I left him one off. Brad, can you go to Daniel eleven and verse forty one? In Daniel's prophecy of things that are coming at the end, we get this verse. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. <coughs> Giving us uh, in Daniel uh, a couple of places, nations, locations that uh, will be safe during this time. We also get Isaiah chapter 16 and Isaiah's prophecy. And in Isaiah chapter 16, starting in verse 1, we get, Send ye the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah to the wilderness, under the mount of the daughter of Zion. For it shall be that as a wandering bird cast out of the nest, so the daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of Arnon. Take counsel, execute judgment, make thy shadow as the night in the midst of the new day. Hide the outcasts, betray not him that wandereth. Let my outcasts dwell with thee, Moab. Be thou a covert to them from the face of the spoiler. For the extortioner is at hand, the spoiler ceaseth, the oppressors are consumed out of the land. Uh, and I asked Brad to, to give me the Amplified version of this in the Amplified Bible just to give a little more context of Isaiah 16.1 in the Amplified. Send lambs to the ruler of the land, you Moabites, from Selah, that is Petra in Edom, 
through the wilderness to the mountain of the daughters of Zion, Jerusalem. So we have in separate places this idea of a place that will be safe during this time. And it's, it's an area, it's a region, and people that uh, understand the Bible and, and read it and know it, know exactly where it's at, we have to look at it a little bit and study it a little bit more. But again, as we said in, in, the, in Revelation chapter 6, where we kind of left off, uh, in chapter 12, verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness where she had the place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Last time we went in, we won't go back to it. Matthew 24, where Jesus is telling about the time. He said, when you see the abomination of desolation, when you see the Antichrist set himself up as God in the temple, you better run for the hills. You better get to the wilderness. You better get to the place that I have prepared for you as a place of safety for 1,200, three score, 60 days, 42 months, three and a half years, the final three and a half years of tribulation where the Antichrist and the dragon, the devil, and the false prophet will try to destroy you. But there is a place of safety. That place of safety is described in several places that we've just read to you, mainly in the land of Moab and the land of Ammon. And when you go through and look at the Old Testament and you look at Canaan and, and early on, you see the Moabites and the Ammonites and just several of the Ites. You know, you had the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Ites, 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 and Ites. Well, these are the Moabites and the Ammonites. Uh, Brad's going to throw us up a map real quick. This is modern day Middle East. If you look at a map, there's probably better maps out there. I just grabbed a quick one that had some colors on it. Today, Israel. There is the Dead Sea, the Jordan River, Egypt. Down here is the Gaza Strip where you always hear problems. The West Bank where you always hear problems. The Golan Heights where you always hear the problems from their neighbors trying to attack them. But on the other side of Jordan is the country Jordan. In the country Jordan, the capital is Ammon. From Ammon, as in the Ammonites. When you go and look at a map of the old 12 tribes, as Brad will switch to that one, it's hard to see, but you can still see the same Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea. Modern day Israel modern day Jordan. Part of the original tribes of Israel was over in what is now the country of Jordan. If you can see, I know it's hard to see from where you're sitting, but it says here, Edom, Moab, Ammon. Gentiles. Not part of the Jewish 12 tribes, but with their ancestors being part of it. Edom, the Edomites, part of the line of Esau that God hated. Moab and Ammon are actually the descendants of Lot, Abraham's nephew. Without getting into all the Old Testament soap opera stuff, Lot had children by his two daughters. One was Ammon, one was Moab. The Bible tells us that in this time, the wilderness of Moab will be the safe place. Specifically, as we read to you in Isaiah 16, and as we think it says in Daniel 11, a specific place in Moab that was thought for years to just be a myth. You've heard often of the city of Atlantis. The lost city of Atlantis was there really a lost city of Atlantis. Well, there is a city that's mentioned there in Isaiah 16 called Petra. And for years people said, is there really a Petra? Nobody knows where this Petra is. But about 200 or so years ago, an archaeologist said, I think I know where it is. And they began to excavate and make stone or out of rock. In one place, there's a very narrow entrance into it, and then it just kind of opens up. When you look at it from above, it just looks like, just tunnels and caves. And you can see by looking at it how it might be really a place of refuge. And it is there. You can go to Jordan 
you can go to Petra and you can see it. Uh, on this map, Petra lies somewhere. Oh, I'm sorry. Go to that next map of Jordan because I got it on there. There we go. Petra is right here. Again, if you could just kind of in your mind see the other maps. Here is the River Jordan coming down to the Galilee. There's your Dead Sea. Right there is Petra. Got a couple of pictures of Petra and Brad will come up there. Maybe you'll recognize. Right that is carved out of stone. If you want an idea about how big that is, that's a man standing right there. You can see that little dot. That's a fully grown man. All that is carved out of that stone. All right, Brad. There's one of those narrow entrances in those rocks. So you can see how that would be considered a place of safety. To get in and have that one little way and then get in again. You can see the mammoth size of these carvings. This is a huge place. Uh, Brad, is there one more picture or is the next thing the video? Yeah. I'm going to show you a video just quickly. Two minutes. A two minute clip. <coughs> just kind of give you an idea of the scale of what it's like. Our Brad plays that. Deep within Jordan's desert canyons lies an ancient treasure, the stone city of Petra. This massive, hand-carved metropolis provides a window into an ancient civilization. A hidden network of tombs, monuments, and elaborate religious structures are carved into the sandstone cliffs. Believed to have been settled as early as 9000 BC, it developed into a thriving capital of the Nabataean Kingdom. This culture ruled much of modern day Jordan from the 3rd century BC until the 1st century AD. It's a three hour drive from the capital city of Amman and two hours from the Red Sea port town of Akaba. Reducing Petra to a single day trip is a common mistake. The site spreads out over a hundred square miles, four times the size of Manhattan. Spend at least one night in Wadi Musa, the closest town to the site, and plan your sightseeing as a series of steep terrain hikes. While donkeys, camels, and horse buggies can hasten travel time between highlights, most of the sites are best reached on foot. Licensed guides have exceptional knowledge and can add a deeper dimension to your visit by showing you secret tombs and hidden details. Sunrise and sunset are when Petra truly glows. So come early and stay late. So a hundred square miles, in tombs, caves, caverns. Pretty easy to see how that could actually be a place of safety. Uh, I believe the, the Bible points it out as to being the place that is in the wilderness. Again, remember, whenever you see wilderness in the Bible, it's not like wilderness like walking out here to the side of the church and getting in the woods. Wilderness in the Bible is barren, dry, desert, rocky places. It's not trees and bushes. So as you get out in the wilderness and Israel flees from the moment of the Antichrist setting himself up as God, we can see where this could actually very easily be a place of safety that they go. And I believe that's what the Bible is referencing there uh, in Revelation 12, 6. Now, also interestingly enough, and I, I give Valerie credit for this, uh, 20 years ago when they came out, Valerie read all the left behind books. As we have gotten back into uh, Revelation, or gotten into Revelation, she got back into those books, and what are you about? 100 pages left. How many books were there? 12, 15? Oh, Valerie just said all right, so Valerie's on the last book with about 100 pages left since we've been, since she's gone through them really quick again. Um, and for the most part, they're, they're dead on with all the things we've looked at. When it talks about Israel fleeing in the wilderness, it says they're going to Petra. So it's not just some far-fetched idea, but in fact it is a, a real place where we believe uh, that they will be going. 
So, we've got that. Now let's go back to the text of Revelation 12 and let's go to verse 7. Get this interesting verse. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. And then verse 8, and prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. Now, the idea of Michael fighting against the devil. Remember, the devil was an angel. Lucifer, cast down from heaven, drew a third down with him. That left two-thirds and left your other archangels. We've talked about this before. When we believe the archangels were Michael, Gabriel, Lucifer, because that's the ones we get by name. Gabriel being the one who's in charge of announcing things, who brings the news, who brings the glad tidings, who, who announced to Zacharias about John the Baptist. That's Gabriel. Michael always seems to be the fighter. Michael always seems to be the strong-armed angel. We know it. We talked about this just a few services ago. If we had to go to Jude, remember there's no chapters in Jude, so just verse 9. Likewise also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil, uh, evil of dignity. I'm sorry, that's verse 8. Then verse 9. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked thee. We get Michael fighting with the devil over the body of Moses. We kind of talked about that when we were talking about who the two witnesses might be. We don't know. We don't get any details about why they were fighting or what the devil wanted to do to the body of Moses. But Jude tells us there was a fight. Back in Daniel, when we covered Daniel and even other times because this was uh, one of Mallory's favorite chapters and favorite section of verses, especially when she was uh, going through her chemo treatments. But in Daniel chapter 10 and verse 12, just kind of remind you. Then said he unto me, fear not Daniel. This is an angel that's come to answer Daniel's prayer. For from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. The kings of Persia, the idea of the world, and the leader of the world is the devil and his system, and the idea that the angel that was coming to answer Daniel's prayer told Daniel, I was coming, but I got held up in a fight basically with the devil, and then I wasn't doing so hot, and then Michael came, and we withstood him and beat him, and then I was able to get here to come answer your prayer. So the idea of Michael and the devil fighting is nothing new. The problem has been the devil has still always been, a been able to withstand enough to stay in the fight. But again, Brad, you're doing a great job. If you'll go back to Revelation 12, 7 and 8. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, the devil. The dragon fought his angels. And then I like verse 8, and prevailed not. In other words, he doesn't win again. He loses again. But this time, notice what it says. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. Their place. <laughs> The devil, the dragon, nor his angels, the one-third of the angels that he was able to take. You say, well, they, should, they shouldn't have had a place in heaven anyway. Well, for some reason, God has always allowed the devil access back to heaven. We don't know why. Don't understand it. If you were God, you wouldn't let him. If I were God, I wouldn't let him. But you ain't God, and I ain't God. And God has let him. We know it, going all the way back to Job. If you, if you remember Job, and just real quickly, Job chapter 1. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and is true evil. 
Then Satan answered the Lord and said, The Job feared God for naught. Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he'll curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Satan has had access, opportunity to talk to God. He's able to go in and out. He goes here, and God's bragging on Job. And the devil gets mad. That's because you put a hedge around him. You blessed him. Put your hand on him. Hurt him. Take, take some of his stuff. See if he won't curse you to his face. And so the, uh, the Lord said, go ahead. You just can't touch him. We'll remember what happened. He lost everything. But he wouldn't curse God. He didn't foolishly charge God. We get to Job chapter 2 and verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered thy servant Job? There's none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him, to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he'll curse thee thy face. The Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he's in thine hand, but save his life. So again, we have this, the devil coming in the presence of God. Well, that didn't work, but I tell you what, skin for skin, man will give anything for his life. You touch his bones, you, you touch his health, you knock him down, he'll curse you to his face. God said, okay, go ahead and do it. Now, side note, I always take great comfort these verses, because you know what that means? It means that even as powerful as the devil is, he still can't do nothing to God's people unless God lets him. God's still in power, God's still in control. Now, in our Poor people, me and us, we go, I just wish he wouldn't let him do nothing to us. Well, he does. He does allow him to do things to us. He still allows the devil to have a spot to be able to come to and throw into heaven and to stand before God and challenge God. And the text there in Revelation tells us, and here in just a minute, the things he does before God. He does before God just what he did here. He accuses you. He accuses me. He brings us up to God. God allows him to work in and around our lives. But one day is coming when those times will be over. Back to the text of verse 7 of chapter 12. I'm sorry, go ahead and go to verse 8, Brad. And prevail not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. You know what that means? At this point, the devil's finally going to get kicked out. No more will he have access. No more will he be able to go and do what it says he does. So let's look again at what he does. Verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out. Just in case we hadn't known who the dragon is, it tells us. That old serpent, reminding us of who he was all the way back in the garden, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Well, you know, I kind of like the odds. Michael had two-thirds of the angels going against the devil and one-third of the angels, so he had an outnumber two to one. And he finally beats them, and they kick him out of heaven for good. Verse 10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. You realize what's the, that's what the devil's doing right now. We talk about all the time the devil's at work in this world. He is. Let me tell you where else the devil's trying to work. He's trying to work in heaven against you and me, bringing accusation against us. And guess what? He's right. Everything he accuses us of is right. 
Because we're filthy, rotten, stinking sinners. Right. Right. But the problem with what the devil's bringing is this. God says, keep talking. The blood of Jesus is applied to them so it doesn't matter. Amen. Right. They've been forgiven. Yeah. They're saved eternally. Yeah. You can rail against them. You can accuse them. You can do everything you want to do. But guess what? Just like he stood up and said, if you consider Job, he stands up and says, have you considered Kevin? Have you considered uh, May May? Have you considered June? Have you considered, K well, yeah, Kathy? <laughs> have you considered them? You go, well, we're not good enough to do that. No, we're not. But we stand in the blood of Jesus, which right. makes us perfect. Right. So all his accusations are of naught anyway. But the day's coming when the accusations will be done. Right. He'll not be there to accuse anymore because he won't be welcome there anymore. Right. And so the Bible tells us here that, boy, they just break out in praise because yeah. the accuser that's always been accusing us is now done. And here's why I asked Denise, to sing her song. Verse 11. Yeah. And they overcame. Yeah. You remember her song. The exact words are. You can overcome. Yeah. By the blood of the lamb. Yeah. By the word. Yeah. Of your testimony. Amen. That's where that line from that song came from. Amen. Revelation 12. 11. <laughs> they overcame. By the blood of the lamb. Yeah. And by the word. Of their testimony. Mm -hmm. Testimony of being saved by Jesus. Yeah. And word. In the beginning was the word. Jesus Christ the word. And then verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens. And ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you. Having great wrath. He's been finally kicked out of heaven for good. He can't be up there accusing. He's done. We're at the midpoint. There's 42 months left. There's three and a half years left. There's 1,260 or 1,203 score days left. And he is mad. Why is he mad? Because he knows he had but a short time. In pro football games, you get the two-minute warning. This is the devil's two-minute warning. He knows now. When this point happens, when we get here, he ain't got much time left. And guess what? We won't have much time left either because it's going to be 1,260 more days before we come out of heaven with him on our horses and our fine white linen on the day of the Lord when all of it finally that's where we're at in Revelation 12, 12. The devil's mad because he knows the end is near. Let's stand. While we sing a verse of, oh, how I love Jesus. Open all up now. If you'd like to come pray, we'd love to pray with you tonight. While we sing.
the preacher that preaches your word, Lord, and just uh, pray that you'll just continue to help him in his studies, Lord, as he goes through Revelation and, and breaks it apart, divides it, to, to give it to us so that we can take comfort in your word, just knowing that the end is near and uh, it won't be long before we're called up with you, Lord. We thank you so much for that. Take us through the rest of this week, Lord, and you just lay hands upon us and just continue to shower for your grace and mercy and uh, bring us back safely at this point in time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.